Hi guys and welcome to episode 7 of Behind the Frame. I hope you guys are enjoying the series so far and um, last week's guest episode hosted by Mike proved to be very successful um, and a lot of you guys I was quite surprised to see on Instagram when I did a poll how few of you had actually used the graduated filter or knew how to use it. Um, so I'm glad that there was uh, some, some tips and tricks that came out of that for you and if you see any images from any other team that you would like them to explain how they captured the scene and how they processed it please do let them know or let me know and I'll make sure that they then host an episode of Behind the Frame to share more of that information with you. Today's episode, I'm going to um, take a slightly different route. I want to have a look. Um, there have been a number of questions, uh, people asking about the technique of panning. And so there will be a little bit of editing. I want to show you one little trick which I used on one of these images. But I wanted to chat a bit about panning. Um, so in panning and intentional camera movement are high up on the list for a lot of our guests that join us on Safari. They really want to get to grips with that and they, they struggle with it, but they actually struggle with it more from um, a self-inhibition side of things than anything else. It's not an easy technique to get down and, and people also like to try and practice this at every opportunity. So if something's running, they're going to pan it. Um, and that's not always the case. So you need to think carefully about number one, the technique, but number two, when do we pan? And so I've pulled up a couple of examples which I wanted to run through and just share with you. Um, I'm going to show those to you now and, and then kind of discuss a little bit more of the settings and that sort of stuff behind each of these, these images. Um, so the first thing that I can tell you is that every single one of these images that you see here was captured after five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I can remember each and every one of these scenes and without fail, the decision to pan was combined both with the point of view that the animal was moving, there was the potential for it, but mainly from the fact that the light was so poor that trying to get a sharp shot of the scene would, you know, would have required ridiculously high ISOs. Um, so the time plays an important role in it and understanding how far you're willing to push your camera and how high an ISO your camera can handle before you decide to start playing around with panning is an important thing. So do push your camera and see how far you can push it. But essentially you're making a decision, and I always use this, those of you who have been on Safari with me would have heard me say this, but are you going to fight the light or work with it? So fighting the light would mean increasing your ISO to get a decent shutter speed, a fast enough shutter speed to freeze the scene. Working with the light would say, well look, the light is so poor now that this is actually a really good time to work with it. The camera wants to give me a slow shutter speed as it is. Let me try this, let me play around, let me try and create something. And this is something else that I always say is that Panning is the closest that we will get to literally painting with light. Obviously the term photography means to paint with light, but here we're actually starting to emulate brush strokes. So you can be a lot more creative and it's either moving with your subject and brushing that background or perhaps just swirling the camera around or keeping the camera still in some instances and allowing your subject to move through the scene. So let's, let's take one of these examples. Um, we're going to have a look at this image here. So this was captured in the Mara a number of years ago and those of you who have had the privilege of witnessing a river crossing will know that it's quite a dramatic affair. So if we have a look at the technical specs on this, this was captured at an ISO of 100. Obviously we're wanting the camera to be as or as uh, what's the right word? So not very sensitive to light as possible because we were intentionally choosing to shoot with a slow shutter speed and you'll see that I had to still stop down to f9 to get the shutter speed down to 0.4 of a second. So this is very slow. And what the intention here was, was to show the chaos of a crossing. So you've got this movement down at the bottom where all of these wildebeest are starting to slip up on the rocks as they're trying to escape. You've got the rest of the herd trying to move out to the top left-hand side of the frame. And so a slow shutter speed coupled with a little bit of a, a slightly exaggerated bump at the end, and that's why you've got this bit of a panning movement here, helps to convey a sense of chaos um, and just really give you an idea that you're inside of this crossing. You don't have a particular point for your eye to rest in the image and so you're kind of wondering and exploring and in that itself it's helping to create that sense of chaos. So here I opted for a very slow shutter speed. 
Um, looking at the aperture value of f9, it was still fairly bright. It wasn't completely dark or anything like that. So at ISO 100, 560 mils, just stopping down the aperture to reduce the amount of light that is coming in, and in turn, giving me a slower and slower shutter speed. Having a look at another example here, this Rhino image was taken at about quarter to six in the evening, a Clo Dam in Medicra Game Reserve. And again, the Rhino are moving from right to left. It's very low light. So this was taken at ISO 100 again, because we don't need the camera to be very um, sensitive to the light. F5, and again, 0 0.4 of a second. Now that is hell of a slow. Um, something else that you've got to remember when you're working with panning is that not every shot is going to work and not every shot will come out like this. So trust me, what you're seeing here and what you would see from anyone else who shares panning images is the cream of the crop. There are plenty of images that were captured before this one, leading up to this moment, which ultimately within a series of images is what you're able to find as one decent image that will work. And you may not be able to find one every time, trust me on this. But the idea here is to pick up on the movement of the subject and try and move with them at the same pace. So it's a bit like skeet shooting where you kind of trace and then you would pull the trigger once you know that you're in the same sort of um, plane and focal movement as your subject. Essentially what you're trying to do here is move the whole time but allow your subject to fall into that exact same point of the sensor throughout the exposure. So it's very important that you actually move and you pick up on something that you focus on one point and you move with that, allowing that to fall sharp and in focus, then everything else gets blurred and that's what gives you the sense of movement here. Um, funnily enough, the easier this becomes, uh, this becomes a lot easier, the faster the animals move. Um, and also there's a kind of a, a happy medium between your focal lengths. So obviously the more focal length you have, the more exaggerated this movement is. Think about a big 600 mil lens, you're zoomed all the way in, slightest bit of movement becomes exaggerated compared to an 18 mil lens when you turn very little movement. But there's a happy medium. Obviously panning with a very big 600 mil lens, there's the opportunity for sort of camera shake to creep in and obviously the slower you go, the less steady you will be. Um, I've found that anything from 200 to 400 mils works really well. The 100 to 400 Canon or the 80 to 400 Nikon, great. Nice, lightweight, you can kind of pan very easily. There's very little vertical movement there, even if you're not using a panning plate. Um, a 300 mil prime lens on both Canon and Nikon work fantastically well as well. So again, f5, 0 0.4 of a second, dramatic movement shown in the frame here. I'm gonna jump across to this image um, of a cheetah in the Mara. This was late afternoon, uh, half past five in the evening. We were following a group of uh, three youngsters and a female cheetah. We saw the gazelle, we saw where they were gonna chase. We positioned ourselves perfectly. It was very overcast. Um, uh, but it's still fairly bright um, and I knew I had a 70 to 200 on the, on the camera. I wasn't going to get the kind of tight intimate shots and I wanted to try and paint the scene. Um, so I stopped down in this instance to F14 which tells you that it was actually there was still quite a bit of light around um, and so I really needed to constrict and reduce the amount of light that was coming through to get a slow shutter speed and this was taken at a 15th of a second. Now Often people who try and practice with these slow shutter speeds in the middle of the day end up with horribly overexposed images because there's only so much the camera can do. Even at f22, um, you're not going to be able to kind of reduce all of that light. So there will be areas of the image that become overexposed. And that's why uh, more often than not, images of panning end up being shot as black and whites. However, if you make the call and rather try and work with the light, and so we're talking shooting and panning after dark when it gets quite, when the light is very low. What you'll find is that all your colors remain in the image because they're not being overexposed and it makes perfect sense. And so these beautiful scenes where you've got these rich greens and reds from the flowers and, and whites from the flowers that may be in and around that environment or even the yellows rather than this kind of plain overexposed image comes from the fact that that was shot in low light where the scene wasn't overexposed. You can obviously imagine that if you're going to try and shoot at a tenth of a second or a fifteenth of a second in order to prevent overexposing you actually need to be shooting in very low light. The final image that I want to touch on shows exactly this. Now, this was a spectacular sighting that we had in Lake Makuru. 
um, we had this, this lioness who was sitting up on a fever tree and she was lying there and we just knew that she was going to come down. Now, there are a couple of things here that I can touch on. I've spoken about animal behavior before. We're looking at the, the, the angle of the tree, we knew that there was only one way that she was going to come down and we positioned ourselves for that moment. So we got our shots when she was sitting up in the tree, she glanced over her shoulder, we got the nice documentary type portraits of this lion in the tree. Um, and then it was a case of she is going to get moving. It's late evening. This one was taken just after six o'clock in the evening. So very low light in a foresty environment um, and taken at one thirteenth of a second at f4. So again, now here you can, you can see that there's actually very low light. ISO 160, so the camera's not very sensitive, 200 mils, f4. So even though we're trying to get a slow shutter speed, I'm actually trying to allow quite a bit of light in. And this is the other beautiful part, because not only does f4 allow light in, but it gives you a shallower depth of field. You can actually see when you pan in f22 and these high numbers that there's depth throughout the scene. So you don't get the kind of subject separation that you're looking for um, when you're able to shoot at f2.8 or f4 in low light like this. Um, and at 1 13th of a second. So knowing that she was going to come down, that's what we positioned ourselves for. We knew that shooting this kind of a scene with this kind of movement in that kind of light would have required very high ISOs and probably would have been nothing more than just a documentary type shot. So throw caution to the wind, and it sounds bizarre to pan a lioness coming down a tree, but in these this kind of situation with all these environmental factors, going for a slow shutter speed and panning and moving with the subject was the right call to make. Um, all of the guests in the vehicle got the shot as well. Um, and so the trick that I wanted to show you here from an editing perspective, having touched on panning and the techniques that we're using, and you can see the kind of brush strokes from the angle that we're panning through here, but the, the trick that I wanted to show you, um, the other side of this uh, image is that at the base of this tree, so this is right adjacent to the road, at the base of this tree was actually some packaging. So they'd placed sandbags along the edge of the road to reinforce it because of the amount of water. Those white highlights at the bottom is reflection of the sky on the water. So they'd actually packed these sandbags around there. And part of the reason that we wanted to shoot and pan this was that if you'd shot it normally, as she's about to come down, if you have a look in this bottom left-hand side of the tree here, that hint of blue, is a little bit of branding on one of these sandbags. So very obvious if you've just captured the frame and the scene and allowed your subject to come through, that, being, that sandbag would have been very, very obvious. But by panning it, we've kind of obscured the shape. So you can see that. Now, obviously to anyone's eye, looking at a patch of blue in nature, very unusual, unlikely, and it kind of suggests that maybe there was something um, not quite right in the scene, very easy to address. So if you come over to your hue, saturation, and luminance slider over here, remember hue refers to the type of color. So if we're looking at a green, what kind of a green is it? Is it a yellow green? Is it a blue green? And the same with the blues, is it more of a turquoise blue or a deeper blue? Saturation refers to how much of that blue is in the scene. Is there a lot of it or none of it? And luminance is how bright or how dark is that blue? So very easy we've got one little area with blue in it. We want to take it away. We grab our saturation slider, we go down to the color blue, and we desaturate the blue. And because this area here is mainly working on blacks and dark areas and these highlights, all of a sudden you've kind of got that black and white environment there. You can pull down the aqua slider a little bit as well. Um, and just to show you the difference on this color scale again, that's before we remove that little blue bit of branding, and that is after. So, Again, I like to keep things natural. I could have gone in with a spot removal brush. I could have used content to wear full, whatever else have you. These are simple techniques. You're not really altering the content of the image whatsoever. You're just putting on the finishing touches and polishing it a little bit. So those are four images um, that I wanted to bring to you guys to show you how to use panning. In each and every one of them, it's linked to a story. Um, it's been shot in very low light conditions to try and maximize the opportunity of not having to overexpose the image and just end up with a high key black and white image. Um, and it's been done with intent and it has taken years of practice to get to this point and I am showing you the successful shots. I'm not showing you the shots leading up to these moments. So a couple of tips. First thing is don't fight the light, work with it. Throw caution to the wind, risk and reward. 
rather than capturing another sharp image, Jerry's done a post on this in the past, is you know, the world doesn't need sharper images. Create something. Push yourself a little bit further than you used to. Break the habit of just cranking up that ISO. Drop it down, try and pan with your subject and create something special for a change. Um, the technique is to try and stabilize yourself as much as possible and move at the same speed as your, as your subject. You'll be on continuous highs, so you'll shoot a number of frames. You don't shoot from the moment that you're with the subject, get into the alignment, move at the same speed, and when they're kind of moving um, perpendicular to you, that's when you want to start taking a couple of frames at a time. And that's where the migration is great because you've got these herds of wildebeest running across you. It's literally just being reloaded the whole time. So that's it for episode seven of Behind the Frame. I hope you guys have found this useful, not only from the technical spec side of things, but a little bit of the processing that I showed on removing a particular color from an image. Um, as always, if you have any questions around this or any other techniques and images that you may have seen from any of our team on social media, give us a shout. Otherwise, we'll see you in the new week. Cheers.